Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us so early in the morning, oh, dark 30, and I know the coffee lines have been long. I'm Heather Penny, Senior Resident Fellow at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our forum discussion on defining the next generation air dominance family of systems. It's somewhat ironic that we're hosting a panel on next generation air dominance, or NGAD, because as we all know, it's been sh shrouded in secrecy. But what is no secret is that air dominance is the foundation of how the United States military projects and employs air power and, frankly, conducts all joint force operations. And despite how successful the Air Force has been at ensuring this freedom to attack and freedom from attack for our sister services and allies and partners, air dominance is not a birthright. We have to continue to earn it in the battle space. I'm going to take a moment to contextualize where air dominance and the NGAD family of systems approach matters. All you have to do is look at Ukraine. Some folks have learned the wrong lessons from Ukraine and are arguing for a concept that they call air denial, a notion that advocates for ground-based air defense systems instead of what they consider costly air superiority fighter aircraft. First, let's be clear. Both Ukraine and Russia are continuing to fly sorties there is not denied, it is contested. If you are able to truly deny the adversary use of the air domain, that's called air dominance. And why would you not then exploit the air in your combat operations? Second, our Western way of war, of combined arms, is predicated on air superiority. Our ground forces are not sized or equipped to fight without it. If you want that, that's a million man plus army and thousands and thousands of tanks, artillery, surface -to air missiles, etc. Finally, abdicating air, superior, air superiority and the ability to operate from the air domain reduces a force to a protracted and costly two dimensional war of attrition and atrocity. And that is what we're seeing in Ukraine, where both sides have no choice but to feed their sons and daughters into the meat grinder because they do not have air dominance. That is a reason why it echoes World War I. Ground-based air defenses might be cheaper than air dominance fighters of old, but I would argue that an air denial strategy is far more expensive in the cost of actual war in blood and treasure. So when you factor in the family of systems component of next generation air dominance, we have the potential to truly change the game. But I know that you're not here to listen to me you're here to learn from the people who are actually leading the programs that will deliver NGAD capabilities to the warfighter. So with that, I would like to introduce our panel. To the left of me is Greg Seimer, the Chief Technology and Strategy Officer for Northrop Grumman, where he aligns Northrop Grumman's technology roadmaps and developmental programs with warfighter needs. Next, we have Renee Passman with Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. She's a Vice President of Integrated Systems, where she leads strategy development and execution portfolio management, and the transformation for a variety of programs. And finally, we do have a, a, new a new addition joining us, Willie Anderson from Boeing, where he's a vice president of Phantom Works with a long history of leading um, black programs and doing f super secret stuff. So we've got the right people in the right places. With that, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to kick things off by giving each one of, us, each one of you a few minutes to um, introduce yourselves and share some thoughts on this issue. So Greg, let's start with you. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate the opportunity to, to represent Northrop Grumman and, and share with you guys my thoughts on this topic. Um, it, you succinctly uh, summarized the, the threat uh, and what we're up against as a nation. Uh, our peer adversaries are moving fast. Uh, they have the, the, the ability to be uh, playing a home game uh, as we have to cover the entire world and the entire planet. Um, but uh, we're up for the challenge in my mind. Uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, as many of you know, uh, recently rolled out the world's first uh, sixth gen platform a few months ago. Uh, that shows we as a nation are prepared and, and ready to develop and build the, the advanced uh, weapon systems that we need. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit here uh, to start off uh, uh, the other aspects of what air dominance means. Uh, and in my mind, it's the key technologies like sensors and weapons that are gonna enable us to, to have success in this arena. As we move into these advanced capabilities, we need to be able to keep pace with this adversary as that's their biggest advantage is they move very, very fast. Uh, so our ability to move fast and have weapon systems that last multiple, multiple decades with continuous uh, upgrades is the key to success. 
multifunction sensors uh, it, it, that are very open architecture uh, that enable uh, software definition on the sensor so that you can upgrade through software rapidly are a key enabler for this. Uh, it, it will allow us to upgrade these sensors that we get out there on a continual basis. Same thing can be applied to the weapon systems uh, and the weapons, missiles, uh, and, and other uh, uh, enablers and effectors that we can put onto these platforms, both from an RF, VW perspective, but from uh, the weapons themselves as we're able, able to get these electronics and upgrades into the weapons, increase propulsion systems over time, and, and be able to reach out farther uh, uh, to act against our adversaries. Our advantage is the, our ability to move fast, uh, and we need to have systems, uh, capabilities, and acquisition that allows us to do that and upgrade rapidly over time. Uh, I believe we're ready uh, to, to, to solve this uh, challenge uh, and keep up with our adversaries, and, and I look forward to talking more about it today. Yeah, thank you, and uh, also happy to, to talk to everyone today about this uh, important topic. Um, Greg, I think, talked a lot about how a lot of this is really in response to the threat and what, and you summarized very well kind of what happens if we don't do those type of things. Um, in addition to all of the, you know, exciting, cool, and important technologies that are, that are being worked, um, have been worked, continue to work, and, and really are being powered by um, a lot of, of technological change um, that just always is going faster and faster, um, and that ability to respond quickly, um, I think one of the key things that also separates uh, next generation or dominance is our ability to be agile and flexible because with as quick as the threat is moving the idea that we will be able to predict with purpose perfect certainty what is going to happen 10 years from now 15 years from now or even five years from now is uh, a little bit suspect and so it really comes down to how can we make sure that regardless of what the capabilities are that we will need that we are in a good position to deliver those incredibly quickly um, and maybe with not a lot of lead time. So whether that is through software-defined capabilities where we can compile software a lot faster than we can compile an entire platform. And we've seen from a Lockheed Martin perspective, um, you know, the benefits of that with, um, with fifth gen already with some of the F-35 and other fifth gen platforms and how they're able to fuse that information. But then also, how do we bring that to building the actual platforms, especially for something like a collaborative combat aircraft? And so whether it's some of the investments in flexible factories um, and uh, making sure that we can put together what is needed rather than figure out what's needed first and then build a factory, um, or things like the investment Lockheed Martin has made in um, factories for hypersonic weapons to bring that capability online. Those are some of the key things that as we look at what is needed in addition to the technology, and when a lot of people start to talk about digital and what does that mean, right, for next generation air dominance, it's not just what we deliver, which is hugely important, but also how we deliver to make sure that we're delivering on the timeline and not just, you know, responding or reacting to the adversary, but actually outperforming them, putting giving the warfighter the maximum flexibility to put together what they need that day to respond and also um, get inside what the adversary can do so that they can actually, they need to respond to us. Thank you, Renee. Um, I, so I, I'm just, before we move on to you, Willie, I want to comment. I truly believe that speed is the next offset. As a, as a nation, we no longer hold a monopoly on advanced technology or development. So it's really about how quickly we can get that capability to the warfighter. So thank you for bringing speed up. It truly, I believe, is going to be the next offset. Willie, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for, for chairing this important discussion. We were joking, uh, the, the panelists here, that we've seen each other before. The community is small. Even though I was a stand-in, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've worked together in the past. Um, and my entire goal here is just to make sure that I don't walk away and lose my clearance. So uh, as... <laughs> As we talk about uh, what we're doing on the Boeing side for, for the Gen 6 family of systems, it really amounts to two main areas. Uh, the first one is, is alignment within, within Boeing defense uh, to support our customers. So if some of those are, are paying attention to what Boeing's been doing, in November we uh, realigned six business units into four. And the, uh, it was very, very intentional, it was very, very specific. And if you look at the individual business units, they're, they're, they're aligned along the lines of family, family of systems within these major mission areas. So 
Uh, Steve Nordland, if he was here, he would talk about uh, the new uh, division called Air Dominance. In that division, it has all of our uh, manned fighters, uh, F-15s, 18s, uh, you know, the manned aircraft. It's also got our unmanned aircraft. It's got MQ-28, uh, it's got MQ-25, it's got our CCA areas. It also has uh, our trainer, our newest trainer, T-7A Red Hawk. And throughout that, as we're the reason why we've clustered them together is because it gives us some, some uh, uh, synergy, some lift and uh, speed, if you will. And underneath that also is Phantom Works. Phantom Works doesn't just support this, this uh, business unit, it supports all of BDS, but we're housed under air dominance. And the reason is, is the technologies and the innovation that's come out of Phantom Works directly feeds these, these platforms, allows us the speed that, that uh, Heather was talking about. The, uh, the next area is we've been investing for years, maybe even decades for this moment. Um, and the investments come along three different areas. Uh, it, the uh, digital engineering is, is not just a, a buzzword with us, MBSC, digital thread, digital twin. We're actually making that come, come true and, and it's, it's a reality. Um, we're also uh, investing heavily and by that I mean significantly more than a billion dollars has gone into our advanced factories. We built a new factory for the MQ-25, new digital factory, new digital factory for our, our composite facilities down at Mesa, and we have three new advanced manufacturing facilities going in St. Louis. So we've been investing in, in the, uh, the future for Boeing uh, manufacturing, and now if you connect digital engineering and factories, what we're really talking about is that speed, again, that Heather, Heather mentioned, and it's speed in the life cycle. It's speed in engineering, it's speed in manufacturing. It's speed in, in uh, sustainment and test. All that is a digital link and allows us to be able to react very, very quickly to support the warfighter um, as well as uh, you know, any kind of anomalies and things like that they may see out in the field for the, this advancing threat. Thank you, Willie. So um, I've got a question. You can administrate or you know, man in terms of setting me up for my next question regarding family of systems, right? We know that next generation air dominance is going to be a family systems. It's not going to be the traditional single awesome fighter aircraft that we've had in the past, right? That we all know and love dearly. Um, how would you describe family of systems and why is that so important as we begin to move into the future? And how is that going to provide us that uh, combat edge over our peer adversaries? Who wants to jump in? I could start. Uh, it, in my mind, it, it's more cowbell. Uh, it's affordable mass, and, and it also adds to the flexibility and agility that we all talked about up here. Uh, if you think about uh, being able to bring new capability, whether it's carrying a new weapon, it's whether it's carrying a new sensor, or whether it's a different envelope uh, uh, from a platform perspective uh, that you need, it, you don't have to design an entirely new platform. You can send something as a wingman to go with the primary vehicle, whether it's an F-35, an F-22, and get whatever it is we're talking about. Uh, it, it gives you agility and also from a sensor's perspective. We all talked about digital engineering. We all talked about open architectures. Uh, as long as you're designing the sensors, the systems, the weapons to go onto these platforms so that they can be interchangeable, you can now change your outer mold line and get another capability forward. And not everything has to be manned. Uh, so by having unmanned platforms take off the load of some of the, the capabilities and needs that we have downrange, you can bring more to the fight. And, and it's all about being affordable and controlling costs. The other interesting thing to me from a family systems capability is the, so yes, agility, flexibility for the warfighter, right, in terms of putting packages together, but also um, a sense of resiliency, right? The difference between um, a point-to-point -point network and a mesh network, if one element of your next generation capabilities um, is not available that day or, or something breaks, um, now you have that ability to, just like with a network, heal, uh, come up with a different approach, come up with something else, and you don't have to go and replan and you know not get the, the mission done that particular day. And so not just like resiliency in the sense of, okay, we've got multiple um, uh, IT infrastructures or something like that, but really resiliency in how the warfighter can respond uh, to the threat. And there's an element of unpredictability in there and that element of kind of, you know, strategic flexibility that um, I think it's really important as we um, prepare for this threat uh, that is out there. Renee, you, you bring up some really good points regarding um, capacity provides capability in and of itself. It isn't simply about mass. 
although when we look at the scale and the scope of what will be required, that's definitely that required. But, you know, China plans to dismantle our systems and disrupting the relationships, um, targeting our networks are key elements of their strategy. And also, they have been studying us for years, and so we've become very predictable. So that unpredictability, that ability to uh, reform those relationships uh, through the family of systems and the resiliency of networks, I think, is very key to really sidestepping the way that China plans to, to target us. Uh, Willie, I'd like to go back to uh, comments that you made regarding speed. Um, so you guys are making major investments so that you can go fast, so you can be responsive to the warfighter, you can be responsive to the strategic environment. Every single one of your companies uh, upstage are doing this. What does the government need to do to be able to go fast with you? Well, there's a couple of things that they have done and a couple of things that, they're, that might be in work that they really need to finish. Uh, number one, uh, they have been tackling uh, at least one barrier to speed, which is is uh, kind of the traditional, uh, robust, you know, the traditional way of contracting, through through IDIQs, FOPPers, task orders, they've been uh, changing how they do contracting for, for to be able to speed to contract, which is a is a, a key area that that slows us all down. Um, I'm going to echo something that Greg said. The you know the whole drive to to uh, uh, Open Mission Systems has been a huge enabler for the government and, and for us. Um, and I'm not talking, you know, tier one type OMS with a wrap around it. No, no, no. You got to get down to tier three. You need to be at the box level. And that's where you're competing, you know, at that level to be able to get new things in uh, that might be compliant. But, you know, that's how you, you get speed in development. But an area that they still need a lot of work in, a lot of work in, um, is in security. Um, those of you that deal in our world here, we, we, we have, you know, security constraints for the obvious reasons and so forth, but we're not allowed to be able to easily connect programs together. And, and you know, a, a huge opportunity from a government side is, 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 is continue to go down this, this new uh, initiative that the SECDEF has, has pushed on uh, to be able to um, eliminate a large number of, of security programs and combine things, okay? Not able to easily combine programs and technologies together is slowing us down. You know, if, if I've, we've done a lot of investment in, in, uh, in a lot of different technologies, but I can't take IRAD investment and move it over unless it's on a DD-254 and in, in a program that allows me to be able to do that. All that stuff has to be, has to be cleaned up. He's kicked it off, um, but he's got a long ways to go. It's, it's a, you know, it's, call it security reform. Thank you, and especially since you come from a long, long career of having been in the acquisition uh, world uh, from the black side. So um, I'd like to also then pivot to the role of collaborative combat aircraft, because all three of you mentioned that. And uh, I know that I'm competing with uh, the CCA panel next door with Dr. Caitlin Lee. Since you're here sitting with me, make sure you uh, catch her panel um, on, the, uh, on the videos that we'll uh, post up later. So on the role of collaborative combat aircraft, we understand that NGAD family systems will employ other systems. Uh, so what role will these CCAs play, and what do you envision the relationship between NGAD and CCAs? To me, one of the, um, you know, when you look at CCA, part of uh, the interesting bit is taking a lot of the technologies we've talked about, like digital engineering, like open system architecture, which are really just, you know, entry points at this point to, to these opportunities. Um, one thing that that enables is to say, well, we don't know what role CCA is going to play yet, and we don't need to, um, because we should be able to take these technologies, put together something um, very quickly, ensure that it gets delivered, all of those types of elements. Um, when you think, okay, but what could they do, right? There is a lot of, um, you know, support uh, functionality that can be delivered through an unmanned platform. I think we have to, uh, resist the urge to say, well, they could, you know, do weapons, they could do sensors, they could do this, they could do that. Let's put all of that together on a platform because then you just have more expensive platforms and you can't use CCA to deliver, to grow the mass, like Greg mentioned, that I think is a, is a capability as well. Um, 
but I think tailoring it to what is most useful in the fight. And there may be different versions of a CCA platform, one that is more optimized for, um, you know, activities that are, that are more a little bit further away from the leading edge, others that are more uh, a little bit further. There's a really interesting discussion that's been happening for years on how important weapons development is for next generation capabilities. Um, and so whether it is making sure that we're getting the most out of the weapons that we have, or maybe linking, you know, if there's something interesting and new and different that we can use um, to tie weapons development and aircraft development from a CCA perspective together, that might create a very unexpected uh, capability but again, to me, the interesting part for CCA is regardless of the specific widget, right? How do we use it um, and how does it interface back with the MAN platforms? By focusing on that, we, um, we give the use case some time to develop and then be able to deliver that quickly. To pile on to that, I, I agree on the weapons uh, the, the completely. It's been for Let's just go there. Let's just talk about weapons. Because we know we need weapons. We need mass. We need next generation. We need, we need to have the right ranges. So let's just go. Let's talk about weapons. So it's been four to five decades since uh, a, a weapon and the platform have been designed concurrently uh, so that we're actually pairing the weapons with the weapon system that can carry it to the fight. Uh, so it, we've mentioned all the, the characteristics that we need to think about. It's range, it's speed, it's the ability to sense uh, and be able to find the right targets, and it's also the build, ability to communicate with the weapons. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be from the platform that's firing the weapon, uh, or even uh, if the weapon's coming from, from further back and, and maybe even our Navy friends. Uh, if we can communicate and do the forward pass, engage on remotes, it unlocks a lot more capability. Uh, and, and to further pile on to what Renee was talking about, it, it's all about controlling the ultimate cost of this network of capabilities. Uh, you can make trades on the weapon propulsion and range if you have a CCA that can carry it farther. Uh, you can uh, make the weapon more expensive and, and, and not have to send something forward that you now have to recover and land. So there's a lot of interesting cost trades that can now be considered as we look at the complete family of systems of manned fighters, unmanned platforms, and then the weapons that all of them will carry forward. Yeah, I think um, from a weapon side, there's really three areas that we could do to improve the weapons element of it. First off, if we, if we drive OMS down into the weapon, you know, and I know I'm making this very simplistic, but you could, should be able to look at this like Lego blocks. You know, you can take, take a motor, you can, you can attach to a guidance system. You know, you, you can, they ought to be Lego blocks, and now you've, you, you increase your effectiveness by, by throwing on different sensors on the front end of it. And, and I know it's simplistic, but we, got, we, we can do an awful lot more if we drove OMS down into, into the weapon. The next is the element that Greg talked about, is, is that weapons are going to be networked. You're going to have F-15 uh, EXs launching. I mean, it's, the loadout has been increased. They're going to be launching weapons from a distance, and then they're going to leave. They're not going to be the ones guiding them. Other people are going to be guiding them because it's going to be on a network. And then the last piece of it is, is you know, the autonomy really, you know, is, is, is a thought, but it's coming quickly. Those weapons are going to be able to go in. They're going to be able to take a look at the target they were assigned to and say, that target's already hit. I'm going to go hit my second or third order target. And, and now you're bringing, you know, a whole lot more mass and in a smart way. Thank you. So, um... Let's talk again about speed, right? Um, what components of the NGAD family of systems do you see as the largest stumbling block to NGAD development? I mean, after all, um, it has taken us decades to really develop new aircraft capability. B-21 has been the fastest development that we've seen uh, in, in more than one generation. So we will need to replicate that kind of speed of design and delivery of not just NGAT itself, but also the family of systems, because we know that its efficacy is going to be predicated on fielding the, those relationships in the battle space. So what do you all see as the biggest stumbling block to accelerating speed with NGAD, and then also the family of systems, so we make sure that we get them all fielded near simultaneously? Not to get too like practical and down in the weeds, but I'll uh, I'll echo what Willie said from a uh, security perspective. Right in the past, we might have said you know well, the acquisition approaches or funding stability or you know 
stability of vision. I think it, particularly on the, the latter one, um, the Air Force has been very clear on kind of what their vision is, even as it continues to evolve. And, and that, I think, stability of vision has been, has been very helpful. Um, there's been significant shifts in, in that acquisition approach that allows for a lot more of that agility and flexibility. Um, but when that all comes back down to great, we've got capabilities getting developed in multiple different places. Um, but your TTR takes at least six months and maybe a little bit longer. And so now you are under the question, like, do I do it again? Do I, like, the, or on the, um, on the cybersecurity side, right? There's been so much change uh, when you look at even some of the things that were on the, the exhibition floor today with AI, software capabilities, things like that. If we can't bring those things in easily with the appropriate policies and whatnot to, to really, not have to reinvent those things to be able to push them, to be able to put those those uh, different innovations together. Um, you know that will that will end up being the limiting factor on how quickly uh, we can move. Um, because I think a lot of the things, whether it's the, the the digital engineering, the software development that is coming off of a lot of the current programs. Um, we can develop the capability quickly, but making sure we're actually putting it together and, and not, um, not getting held up by our own policies, I think, is, uh, is one of the, the stumbling blocks from a t speed perspective. You know, uh, I'm going to go back to something that Secretary Kendall said in his, in his opening remarks. He's, they're planning for, you know, two CCAs to, to a Gen 6 or, or an F-35 platform. But, you know, one of the stumbling blocks to making this a reality is data. Right, and so it's not just going to be this this mission set, you know, of, of platforms. They, they need to get data. They're going to be tied to space assets. They're going to be tied to airborne, you know, command and control assets. The whole uh, JATC2 ABMS area. Uh, General Cropsey is making some great strides uh, in that area, but he's got a long way to go. And uh, part of that is 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 synchronizing the uh, the work that the space architecture is doing related to COM. Um, that's, that's still a journey ahead of us. Uh, they've got a lot of challenges to be able to go through and, and for, for essentially uh, the family of systems to be successful, they need to be successful. I'll touch on one thing that's not even related to technology, it's people. Uh, it, B21, as you pointed out, proved we can do it and we can do it quickly, uh, but having the cleared workforce uh, and maintaining that cleared workforce is going to be one of the biggest challenges to moving quickly with this wide uh, array of new developments going on simultaneously. Uh, this is the coolest stuff you could possibly work on. Uh, it should make it easy uh, to recruit, but it, it's, it's a, a challenging uh, workforce out there right now to make sure that we have the, the smart people in these jobs cleared to the right accesses to, to go solve the problems. Yeah, that's a really good point, and I think one that, that worries every single one of us in industry is that next generation and being able to ensure that we have the skilled workforce because there's so much competition out there um, for those engineers. Uh, so let's get back to affordable mass. And we've talked about weapons being a, a means to achieve affordable mass, CCA is a means to be able to achieve affordable mass, but it all comes down to cost, right? And we're all familiar with the term, no bucks, no buck rogers. So, Public statements indicate that the manned component of NGAD is expected to cost in the hundreds of millions, right, with unmanned components being in the tens of millions. And so I think we're all concerned as we look at budget pressures how costs could impact production rate and quantity. I mean, for example, the aircraft that we have right now, we need to be able to accelerate the production rate because the demand for them is today, it's not 10 years from now. So from an industry perspective, how do we control costs such that we can buy the number we need at the rate that we need. I we all mentioned it in some uh, arena, but open architectures are going to help a lot. Uh, it, quantity drives cost and affordability. Uh, the ability to, to design and, and spit out thousands of iPhones makes them affordable enough that we can all carry one in our pocket. Uh, as we could move to open architectures and we can take uh, uh, the same technology, electronics, uh, uh, processors, uh, even uh, aeroframe designs, and move them from a manned fighter to an unmanned fighter and, and even aspects into weapons, it allows allows us to get scale up, uh, which is going to drive affordability. As long as we keep with the open architectures, maintain these architectures so things are portable across uh, industry, uh, so that, that, that I'm using the same capabilities and technology that Renee and Willie are using 
in each of their designs, it's going to drive costs down at the supplier levels uh, and allow us to get the scale up. The other thing, um, you know, we've all talked about various, you know, digital manufacturing, things like that. Um, and I think that is also a key element because just like open architecture, you know, kind of forces us all to think differently about how we move uh, capabilities across platforms. I think some of the advanced manufacturing capabilities and techniques allow us to change how we build things and bring the cost down that way um, because, you know, it really has to be, we have to, we have to do business differently in order to support these kind of affordability goals, which are important because that is also a way that the Air Force can have the flexibility that they need to purchase the systems that they, they need for this particular situation. And if we had used, if we, had, we were still doing compute the way we were doing in the 80s and the 90s and had projected that forward, none of us would be able to afford the iPhones that we now all have in our pocket. But to Greg's point, technology changed, the way those were put together changed, the way business was done changed, um, and I think that's a key part from a transformation perspective um, to make sure that we can hit those affordability targets. You know, uh, to control costs, one element, uh, the way to look at it is, is to uh, essentially shrink, reduce the life cycle, make it, make, it, make it quicker to be able to get capability in the hands of the warfighter. Uh, lots of elements of that that we could spend all day talking about. OMS is, is certainly one of them. Uh, so in, in the area of advanced manufacturing, to prove that point, we're doing uh, full-scale determinant uh, assembly, FSDA. Um, and that, what that is is taking a digital model, handing it to a supplier. He pre-drills the holes, and then it comes to us in that part, and we have first-time quality. And we just make the, the part up. The T7A Red Hawk is a... Is a success story along those lines. Um, essentially, if you look at the production line, if you were to walk that, as I did, you know, you have a couple of ladders and a few, few uh, tool carts that are along that. You don't have the big, you know, stanchion arrays around the, uh, around the platform as it's going. It came together very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's an example, a testament of how you can shrink that life cycle down and it applies to sustainment. It applies all across the life cycle of a program. Just to add to that, because we've all talked about you know, manufacturing and design, right, which is most of what our companies do, but one area that um, is also, I think, very important from an from a, um, affordability perspective and also a speed to the warfighter perspective that we haven't talked about is uh, test, test and evaluation, right? When we look at uh, fifth gen and, and what uh, you know, what it took to get that advanced of a capability in the hands of the warfighter, there's significant time spent in test. And I think one of the really interesting areas for continued collaboration and, and discussion is um, how do we take the power that is inherent from a, a digital thread, digital twin, that we're using very successfully in design and in build and now start to apply that to test. Um, and how do we take some of the advanced uh, capabilities like data analytics, AI, ML, those types of things and, and bring that test timeline down um, to both speed delivery and help from an affordability perspective? Thank you for bringing up that important point because there's so many key components um, of actually delivering capability that we don't necessarily think about. And I think test is, is one of those that drives a significant amount of of time and cost into delivering a program. It's not to say that it's not important, but I think there are different ways that we can think about doing that. So, um, Greg, I'd like to toss in this next question to you. Actually, before we do that, the other thing I think is really important is, as much as, as we talk about cost, what you all are doing is looking at how can we build inherent affordability into the design, into the manufacturing. And it's not gonna make these platforms cheap, uh, but I think we need to ask ourselves, what's the cost if we do not procure these systems, right? There are certain elements of cost that, if you're in the industry, you know there's a, a, a rule of thumb that there's a cost per pound. And that roughly approximates the, uh, the raw materials and so forth that are demanded based off of the mission set for the aircraft. So if the vehicle has to go far, if it has to go fast, if it has to carry a lot of payload, those are going to drive certain sort of non-negotiables for the raw materials there. But you all are looking very interestingly about how do, we, how do we look at where we can create advancements to build inherent affordability as opposed to economic tricks of, of procurement. Because um, I would say that we could use a little bit more help of stability within, the, within our government partners if that was actually the way we had to build 
uh, affordability into systems. So um, very quickly, I'd like to, is it, uh, Greg, talk about sixth generation. Right, what does next generation or sixth generation mean? Because we understand that fifth generation was a step magnitude of capability above fourth generation aircraft. So what does sixth generation mean? What, what is that step magnitude increase of, of, of capability or effectiveness? How would you define that? And then I'd like to open that up to the rest of the team. I think we hit on many of the aspects of, of what 6th gen means to me, and, and you even mentioned as speed is the next offset. I, it, I really believe that's where we're getting. Uh, all of our performance characteristics across the board are just getting better and better. But those are an evolutionary step as we develop technology and, and get it into capabilities. Really what we mean as in 6th gen, or what I see in 6th gen, is our agility and speed. Being able to, to upgrade hardware as uh, frequencies and power and all of the aspects of performance uh, improve for a, an array or for a propulsion system. Uh, having the, those open architectures and the digital engineering and all the design aspects that we've talked about, that we can get that capability on board fast and, and have it continuously evolving and maturing capability over the lifespan so that we don't have these fixed 30, 40 year programs is, is my view of where we're going. I think so certainly agility, speed, to your point, right, that flexibility. To me, one of the things that defines next generation is, is that power of the network, right, the family of systems approach. A single platform is, is not necessarily next gen in and of itself. Um, that, that idea of going in alone and unafraid, those types of things, like that is, We've seen, I think, the, the, the absolute maximum of that capability with the fifth gen cap platforms. And now when we see that capability in the hands of our warfighter, they are already starting to come up with how to use those platforms in different, more advanced ways that would not have been envisioned when those initially were put together. I think it's taking those ideas and making that uh, the point um, that to me really defines the next generation. It's that family systems component, um, bringing it all together and, and really taking the capabilities that um, we've had in fifth gen on a platform level, but now to the entire system of systems. And there's an area of uh, speed and agility that we really haven't talked too much about, which is in the software area. So a key element of, of this uh, is going to be how quickly can we do software upgrades, get it through the pipeline, check it out, test it, and get it onto a platform. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the, in the area of autonomy, that's going to be a rich area. It, you know, the three companies here don't own the, you know, all, all this brain trust related to autonomy. There's a lot of it going on out there. But get, integrating it onto a platform you know, so that the platform has, you know, can perform and can test, safety of flight, all those things, and so it's not a wild, wild west. What we're doing is, is we're taking a look at a framework and essentially part, uh, partitioning off the uh, safety critical elements of it, and then, and then finding the interfaces so that third parties can now connect with us and be able to quickly be able to add capability onto, say, CCA platforms of the future. And then we'll work through the whole integration test element that Renee mentioned and be able to get, uh, get that capability out as quickly as possible. And in some cases, in fact, we just tested it last week at Emerald Flag, is, is you know, being able to take software from our, our uh, software factory and we piped it over a uh, SATCOM communication link into an aircraft that in the air we're going to be doing that in some cases, you know, for, for an update to a threat file or whatever, as aircraft are inbound. You know, all, you know, points to agility and speed for the warfighter, being able to be flexibility. And I think that's a core element of Gen 6. Thank you. So we're coming close towards the end of our time. So what I'd like to do is have a lightning round um, from each of you. What is one thing that, or actually on my last <laughs> lightning round, we had like two or three things, but um, what would you like our audience to, to learn or think about next generation air dominance before they leave this room that we haven't already touched upon or that you'd like to foot stomp? Well, I'll, I'll jump out front so that I, I've got one thing in my head and if they take it, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so uh, I, I think uh, from a lightning round, and this does apply to all three companies as well as 
probably everybody in this room, and it's innovation. So we're at a time now with, a, with, with an adversary that's moving fast, it's highly intelligent, it's throwing a lot at us. We need to be able to, as an industry, be able to come together, work, work together, partner together, so that we can get speed to innovation. And, and now it's you know the open architecture, the software, everything that we've been talking up here are, are key elements to being able to do that. But you know we need to be able to hey you've got something over there that really helps you know that's cool hey let's partner up let's get it onto an aircraft let's get it out and test and get it out to the warfighter. I think that's critical. Yeah, partnership I think is the is one of the my like one word answer, um, whether it is in the innovation space and bringing capabilities, whether it is partnership between the government and industry to understand as the threat is moving or, or you know, capabilities change, what is it that is needed? And also partnership with an industry, um, whether it's things like the consortium activities with open mission systems and how do we drive that forward. Um, we're all on this journey together. We're all working to figure it out. Um, even partnership on, on people, which is one of the most precious resources that we have, um, to make sure that we're truly bringing the best of the nation to bear on this problem and not um, individual stovepipes. I'll revisit a term I've used a couple times, and that's agility. Uh, if you look at where technology was even a decade ago, uh, it, it's just moved so fast. Uh, it, to, to foot stomp Willie's comment on innovation, uh, we need to be agile. We can't be fixed in requirements and stick to those requirements for, for decades. We have to look at where technology moves, and we need to be agile to be able to get that capability out there to the warfighter quickly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this discussion, and I'd once again like to thank all of our guests for their time and their insights. And from all of us at the Air Force Association and the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day.